the Lord. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. God is good. Um, <clears throat> so, I probably have more to cover uh, than we have time, but uh, I'm going to trust that the Lord uh, allows to put some stuff in your spirit uh, and not just uh, the overflow of your head uh, and your intellect, but uh, that you can receive uh, some of these things as well. Um, let's say first of all, appreciate the opportunity to come and minister to you guys. It's been, I've been involved with uh, campus ministry. I started my first campus ministry uh, in 1995. I, I know I don't look like I'm that old, and uh, I appreciate your comment. I felt some of you say that. <coughs> but uh, that was my senior year in engineering school at the University of Arkansas. So uh, it's been a, a, a long uh, intertwined uh, relationship with campus ministry, and I do believe that campus ministry is a key to end time harvest. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't be uh, any more excited to speak to anyone, uh, general conference, etc., uh, than who I'm speaking to uh, this morning. Uh, you guys have the power. You have the power and the opportunity to affect this world. Amen. Uh, say thanks to um, Brother Mike McGurk, the son in the gospel. And um, I did tell him exactly like that, quit being stupid. And, um, and he listened and obeyed, and I'm so glad that, uh, that he did. All right. I want to talk to you, first of all, uh, about the role and rule of covering. I apologize in advance. That's my biggest fan right there uh, that uh, is probably wanting to try to get to his dad uh, at this point. So I want to uh, take text uh, from Acts chapter 1 and uh, verse 1, <clears throat> and I just want to set the setting here uh, to begin with uh, for the New Testament. So this is much like uh, any of you that you are new to new to campus ministry or your uh, first time on campus ministry, this is very similar to what you uh, you know where you are spiritually uh, is that you are at the at the beginning of Acts. So there's a couple of concepts here that I uh, think that we that we that the Lord would have us to uh, understand. And let me also I want to just very quickly before we dive into this, I just want to, I think, it, I can't remember if it was uh, Mike or Brother uh, Hector last night that was talking about burden, uh, whichever one of them it was. <clears throat> um, you can check this out in uh, Second Samuel, but uh, Joab, uh, the name Joab actually means uh, God is our father. And uh, Joab killed three people uh, in the Old Testament. Joab is a uh, type and a foreshadowing of the spirit of Antichrist. And uh, if, you, if you go through and you look at who Joab killed, he killed Absalom, <coughs> he killed um, Abishai, and he killed Amasa. And if you look at the names of the three people that he killed, what he killed was he killed God's commandment, he killed God's revelation, and the last thing that he killed was a mesa, which a mesa literally means burden. <clears throat> and the, if there is nothing else, and I feel the Holy Ghost, nothing else that you guys get out of uh, this setting, uh, if you can catch the burden, uh, and if you, if you go study this out, what you'll find is, is that a mesa was bleeding out in the street. And um, the, the Bible says that the people stood still and gazed at burden. Burden was so strong, it was so compelling that it, that it, it kept the people in the street. And they, they had to get a mesa out of the road so that people would go back to what they were doing, to their normal everyday lives. And that's how strong that burden can be in our lives. Burden for the lost, burden for our, for our campuses, that... When nothing, nothing else will empower you, nothing else will get you up out of the bed, nothing else will take you to the streets, burden, mm. burden, burden, a 
burden for the lost will make you go. It will make you, it will compel you. The role and rule of covering. Uh, the Bible says, Acts chapter 1, it says, The former treaties have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to, to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard for, of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, Listen, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. This word power, uh, first of all, I, I, let me uh, preface all of this by saying that uh, the, uh, the Bible was not written in English, right? Everybody understand that? The Old Testament was written mostly in Hebrew. There was some uh, one other language that it was written in, but the, but the New Testament was written in Greek, uh, biblical Greek. It's a little bit different than the Greek uh, that is spoken uh, today. And so there are certain nuances <clears throat> in the Greek language. Uh, biblical Greek is much more uh, pictorial language uh, than the English language. And so there are some nuances where that when you look at words that are translated, uh, Greek words that are translated to English, sometimes uh, those words that are translated, it's the exact same English word, but if you go back to the Greek, you'll find that it's a different word, uh, it's a different meaning or a different Greek word altogether. Uh, and the reason I bring this to your attention is, is that when you look at uh, this particular passage and the word power, uh, the Greek word is dunamis, and it's where we get dynamite from. And uh, basically, uh, this word means uh, that it is the miraculous power. It's the ability, abundance, meaning, might, uh, the working of miracles. But it's the power and the strength. What Jesus said is that when you receive the Holy Ghost, that you would receive the ability, the power, and the strength to do what you needed to do in wherever you went. Amen. Anybody in here that you don't have the Holy Ghost? All right, excellent. Everybody in here, you've got the power to do everything that God calls you to do. The very most important thing that any of us can do is the will of God. Uh, if you do the will of God in your life, you, you have done uh, a great thing. But the will of God will always take you to a place that your time, talent, and treasure will not be able uh, to do what God's will is. And that's where God's grace kicks in. And uh, I know that most people uh, define God's grace as God's unmerited favor, and that is true enough. That's the noun definition of God's grace. But let me give you the verb de definition of God's grace from the Greek, and it is God's unlimited supply of what you lack to accomplish his will. God's will will always take you to a place that you can't accomplish it. But God's grace is sufficient to make up the hedge of what you can't do. And the reason that God does that is, is because he doesn't want anyone to steal his glory. And so he, when God's will is done, God doesn't want anyone to be able to say, I did this, or, or, or I, I did, they want to be able to say, if it were not for God, this couldn't have been done. Because I had so little to do with it. It was God's grace that made, it, that made up the difference, that made up the gap. And so <clears throat> when, we're, when we're talking about what, what you got when you got the Holy Ghost, God gave you the power to be able to do everything that, it, that you are called to do. He gave you the power to speak to spirits on your, 
on your campus and to bind them and to rebuke them. Amen. I, I remember distinctly one campus uh, around here that we went to, and we, had, we, we couldn't, I mean, there wasn't enough. When we were on that campus, there wasn't enough anointing on there uh, to, to make a, a sock move. I mean, there was just no Holy Ghost at all. And I remember that uh, we, 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 uh, we did a prayer walk around the perimeter. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I want you to walk. And he gave me the scripture that wherever you put, wherever the sole of your feet that you put that, that I'm going to give you the land. And we walked that campus. And within just a few short, I think it was like four or five weeks, we prayed almost 2,000 people through to where that we, wouldn't have, we couldn't pray anybody through uh, prior to, and when I say two dozen people praying through, I'm talking about two dozen people being prayed through on that campus, not taking them somewhere else. Not God gave God gave us God gave us the land that we had gone through. We everyone has the power. Everyone in this room, you have the power within you. If you have the Holy Ghost, you have the power within you to be able to go back to your high school, to your campus, and wherever you put the sole of your feet to be able to claim that land for the kingdom. Amen. Everybody believe that? <clears throat> so the question that I've come with, one of the questions I've come with this morning is, is why isn't that happening? Let's just be real. 35 people, I'm guessing. Right? Is that close? Roughly. 35 folks in here. So the question is, uh, if we've got that power, we've got that ability, why isn't this place stacked out? Amen. Is this thing on? All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about why that uh, in many cases that it doesn't work. Uh, the word power, uh, let's just go ahead and go down to Matthew 28, verse 18, and I'll just give you the answer up front. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 28 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So here you've got the same English word translated power. But uh, in Acts chapter 1, that word power is dunamis. It is the power, it is the ability, it is the strength to be able to do that. But here, when Jesus said, all power is given unto me, that Greek word is exousia. And it, is, and it is more closely defined as being the authority. Power gives you the ability to, some, to do something. Authority gives you the right to do something. And the issue of why this joint's not packed out is not power. It does, it's, not a, it's not a matter of that you've got some uh, lesser strength of the Holy Ghost than you, than you, than you, than me, whatever. What it, what it is is the difference is walking in authority. You've got the power, but you don't have the right to do. Power is the ability, but authority is the right. It is the lawful right to do what we need to do. This word, <clears throat> exosia, it's a compound word, compound Greek word. So uh, in the Greek, many words are, are, are made up of smaller Greek words that they put together. And that's one of the reasons that there's more flavor and more nuances to the Greek language than there is to the English language. But if you go, if you go and study out uh, the, the Greek word here, what you'll find is, is that one of the words that makes up exousia or authority is that it is the point or the initiation of action. Authority is what starts something in motion. Power is what gives you the ability to do it, the strength to do it. But when you're operating in authority, authority gives you a starting place. 
a place that you can move from, a, a place that you can begin from, a place that you can go from. That's why Jesus said that I, all power is given unto me. And he, he made that statement. He proclaimed that in faith. Now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He was speaking faith. But then after he got through talking about authority, what he did was he said, go ye therefore. He sent them after he told them about authority. He didn't send them in Acts chapter 1. He sent them to the upper room in Acts chapter 1 to get power. But he sent, him to the, he sent them to the world when he gave them authority. And what we've tried to do in our lives as young people, we've tried to, uh, we've tried to reach the world on power. And it doesn't work. We've tried to go out into our high schools and our campuses and only rely on power, and it will not work. You'll, you'll save some you, because, because the burden will be so strong that people will look and be drawn to what you're doing. But until you operate in authority, when you begin to operate in authority, there will be a, there will be a break in whatever you're doing. It just won't be one. It just won't be two. It just won't be three. But when you operate in authority, it's hundreds of people. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. The very first campus that we, the campus ministry that we started uh, at Antioch was Anne Arundel Community College. And uh, I had been involved with campus ministry, and I, I do not like this poll. I can't see, I can't get one way or the other. And then when I stand in the middle, I still can't see everybody. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I rebuke you, Paul, but hold up the ceiling. <clears throat> um, so we had been uh, going to uh, this campus, and uh, there was a young man that was there that was from the church, right? And he was the president, I believe, of the student body at the time, or, or maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was elected a little bit later. But uh, so... Uh, there, ha there had been many people, and when I say many, I'm talking about like a dozen or so, two dozen maybe, folks from, ch uh, kids from Antioch, students from Antioch that had gone to Anne Arundel Community College. You want to know how many folks they had prayed through to the Holy Ghost up to that point? Zero. They had power. They had a lot of power, but they didn't have any authority. So when we went up there and we started, we started speaking things, we started moving uh, in authority and proclaiming authority uh, and using the authority that we were under, what happened was, was very quickly, we went from, there was like five people in this Bible study to the very, the, the, uh, very distinct memory, Will, was that we had so many people in that Bible study that we ran out of chairs. We had people that were standing in the wall, on the walls, whether I think there was 28 or 29 uh, people that were in that Bible study in just a few weeks after we began uh, to exercise authority. That semester, if I'm not mistaken, I believe we prayed through about 30 people uh, at, that, at that college. And before then, no one had prayed through. There had been zero. Uh, and, and, and what authority does is that when, when God was done, we had the president, the vice president, uh, several of the senators, I mean, had the whole thing. They, they actually, it was the first campus ministry where we actually got budgeted money from that campus. They went to Youth Congress, to CMI. We went, I mean, we went all over the country on Anne Arundel Community's dime, on their nickel, because there was authority that had moved up in, that had moved onto that campus. Amen. Power, power will get you some of the way. But authority is what you're lacking. Thayer said it, that, that, that authority is the right to exercise power. Having power is one thing. Having the, having the right to exercise it is completely different. And that's where most, that's where we mostly fall down. Authority gives us the right to act. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. So how do we get this authority? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted 
unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were very dear to us. This word, Greek word uh, translated, uh, imparted, is metadidium. And uh, it basically means to give over or to share. <clears throat> it means to share in something with someone. Let me tell you how you get authority. You get authority by those that have gone before you, that those that are, that are uh, elder to you. And you begin to, you begin to latch on to them. The, the re, you want to know the reason that Mike McGurk has been so successful? <laughs> it's, it's because he latched on. He latched on, and I begin to share. And this is the way that ap- we'll we get to this a little bit more, but here's the, here's the defining thing about apostolic authority. I'll skip ahead in the notes. Apostolic authority, act. It, there's, there's one characteristic with apostolic authority. Those that are in authority speak, and those that are under authority do. The Bible says that the centurion had someone sick at, at the house, and he came to Jesus and he said, he said, man, I got someone sick. Jesus said, well, I can't go right now. I'll go a little bit later. But the centurion said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a, I, not so, Lord. I'm a man under authority. And what, how did he explain that? He said, I, I tell one to go. And they go. He's under authority. I tell one to go, he speaks, and they go. I tell one to come, and they come. I tell one, another to do, and they do. And then Jesus makes this peculiar statement. He, we're talking about authority, right? We're talking about submission. And Jesus makes this statement. He said, verily, in all of Israel, I've not seen such great submission, faith. He said, in all, all of Israel, I've not seen such great faith as what, just, as what just transpired. He equated submission to faith because you cannot distinguish the two. And the reason that power will only take you so far and that you've got to have authority in your life is because authority acting in your life requires submission. And if you are not submitted, you do not have faith operating in your life. And faith gives you the ability to cause those to call those things that are not as though they were. And so you can just speak to the wall. Come up souls. You know, give us souls. Give us souls. You can do everything that you want to do. But until you begin to do that in authority, you're doing it. You are not operating faith. You're operating your human burden and your emotions and your desire to do something. You're operating your will. Praise God. Man, I feel the Spirit of God right now. I feel revelation falling in this place. That somebody just got an answer that you've been looking for. <clears throat> so there is an impartation that occurs that that is the way that authority, that is the way that authority begins in your life is you can't, you can't get authority on your own. <clears throat> because the centurion said, you got, you got to, I'm, I'm a man under authority you can't get authority on your own you can get power on your own you pray in your house and get power but you but you can't have you if you don't have authority working you don't have one bit of right to exercise that power so jesus says comes along and he says the whole the key to the whole thing is authority i'm giving you authority and then once he gave them once he declared his authority, he sent them forward. In other words, he said, here's my authority. Now I'm putting you under authority, and now I'm sending you. He didn't send them when, when, uh, when he was talking to them about power. He sent them after he'd been talking to them about authority. First, chapter, uh, First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 says, <clears throat> which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And this word potentate, 
It, it is the strengthened form of, of uh, dominion, of power, of dunamis. And what it literally means is dynasty. And what happens is, is that once you begin to operate power with authority, God establishes dominion or a dynasty on your campus. Praise God. I've, I've seen hundreds of people receive the Holy Ghost in campuses, and the reason is, is not because I had faith, not because I had power, it, not because I had, that I was operating under authority. It was because all of those things were mixed together and God himself established, it, established dominion on that place of ministry. And once dominion occurs, whew, there's a breakthrough coming. Because what that means is, when, when you know when you've got dominion, here, here, let me give you some keys, right, with campus ministry. You know you've got power working in your life when you pray one or two people through. Right? You know you've got authority working when you pray a handful of folks through. 5, 10, 15, 20 folks. Here's how you know that you've got dominion working. is when year after year after year after year, you continue to pray people through to the Holy Ghost. That campus at Anne Arundel Community College is still going strong. That campus is, I think it's somewhere around the, I think it's somewhere around 400 people that have been won off of that campus since 2003. That's not me. That's not power. That's not authority. That's dominion. That every single year, it doesn't matter who the people are. It doesn't matter who's leading it. It doesn't, it, it, because God has established dominion on that place. <clears throat> Praise God. So there is an impartation. There is a coming along. There is a sharing. Uh, that, that must occur for you to receive authority, for you to be submitted. Now, that might be something as simple as your youth pastor. might be something as simple as your, uh, as your pastor. It might be something as simple as finding uh, the person that has gone before you uh, on that particular campus. But regardless of where you look, Jalen, while you're up, can I get uh, a water from you, please, sir? But uh, regardless of where it is that you, that you find uh, that authority, God, here is a principle. Thank you, sir. Here is a principle that you've got to, that you've got to understand in this. So dominion is a dynasty, and it is where God manifests his power and his authority. That's what, that's what dominion is. That's what the dynasty is. is that it's a place that God's authority and his power is seen. So let's talk about this. Here's the statement. God manifests himself under a covering. So I want to talk to you. This first session is about the role and the rule of a covering. Exodus chapter 25 says, uh, this is verse 18. It says, Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Everybody know what a cherubim is? It's an angel, right? A beaten work shalt thou make them two ends, uh, in the two ends of the mercy seat. This is talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall, tre shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. So this is the Ark of the Covenant. This is the place where, where God is going to manifest himself, right? And in this, in this Ark, the way that God puts this up uh, is that he, he takes two, he uh, prescribes that there's going to be two angels. Come here, brother. And he says, they're going to stretch over the mercy seat. I don't know where we can do this, where everybody, but let's just say this is the mercy seat. You get over there, right? And, and, the, and the picture is, if you've got the scan code, I put a picture uh, in my notes so that you can actually look at this. But, the, but what they did with the, those angels, the cherubims with their wings, they stretched their wings over that mercy seat. 
And the very place where God manifested himself in the Old Testament was on that mercy seat. Thank you, brother. He didn't manifest it, any, it, didn't manifest it anywhere else. He manifested himself under a covering. And here's what you've got to understand is that God always works, always manifests himself under a covering. And if you're trying to operate outside of a covering, you better be careful about what you're tr- of what's manifesting in your presence. Because more than likely, more than likely, from a biblical standpoint, if you don't have a covering, whatever is manifesting, whether it's power, whether it's authority, it's not God. Now, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, uh, about how you can know the difference between that. But God, all, God always operates underneath a, a covering. He always operates, always manifests, always shows himself. He always uh, shows his power. He always exhibits his authority. He always establishes his dominion under a covering. Under a covering. Verse 22 says, And there I will meet with you. I'll meet you. Under that covering is where I'm going to meet you. He didn't say that he was going to meet him. He said under that covering, where those angels are, where their, where their wings come together, that's where I'm going to meet you. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark uh, of the uh, the Ark of the Testimony. This word, <clears throat> this word covering is a very unique Hebrew word. And it basically, <clears throat> it may, anybody seen a, ever seen a chain link fence before? You know what a chain link fence is? How many of you don't know what a chain link fence is? Probably some of my kids in Maryland, our kids in Maryland don't know what a chain link fence is. <clears throat> what, it, what it literally, the, the Greek word here literally means is to intertwine as in a fence, except it's a covering. It's, it's a coming along. Uh, that covering means that it, it is, that's what impartation, that's how impartation from the Spirit happens is in that covering, in the midst of that covering. And what that covering actually is, there's an intertwining that occurs. Whew. Man, I want to be covered. I don't want to intertwine myself with with anything other than God, than the Spirit of God, than the authority of God. I want to be intertwined with God. Now here's the, here's the, uh, the, the, the warning that I will give you, the first warning that I will give you. Ezekiel chapter 28 says, in verse 11 says, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a, a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the guard in the in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, thy sardis, tap, tap, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the concubine, uh, and gold. The workmanship of the tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so that whilst thou were on the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stone of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Anybody want to take a guess who that's written about? Who? Lucifer. So the same way that the kingdom works is the same, the the kingdom of God is the same way that the kingdom of Lucifer works. He operates his kingdom under a covering because he is the cherub. He He is the anointed cherub that covereth. And the only way that authority works is under a covering. Now, I know that that might go against some of your doctrine that, you know, that Lucifer's got any power or any authority. But if he didn't, I mean, this place would be full. And the fact that it's not, you're just just denying. Amen. So all, all power, 
all power works underneath a covering. And even uh, 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 our power and our authority must, w- must work underneath a, a covering. So let's talk about this, this New Testament covering. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 1 says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, and being absent and bold toward you, but I I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, this is a quick sidebar, okay? But uh, the word, the Greek word "war" there is strategia, and 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 that's where we get the word strategy, the English word strategy. So the the fact that Brother McGurk's up here talking about that we're going to get strategy, that God's going, we don't. It, it is the war. Strategy is what we're going to do in the war, and 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 the way that that works is underneath a covering. We don't war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? Listen, listen, listen. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? Do you do things because you see it, because you've got the natural going on? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, for though I should uh, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Here's authority. It, it is exousia that is translated authority. And, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians that I gave you authority which the Lord has given us for edification. And the Greek word edification here is okidom. And it is, it is literally two Greek words. It's oikos which is a house or a dwelling or a small group, but it is a specific house or dwelling or small group because the Greek word, D-O-M-E, denotes that it has a rooftop. It has a ceiling. Read, re, you can read this as is that it has a covering. God has given us authority so that when we edify, right, that what we are doing is is that we are creating and building a covering. If you're going to be used in the kingdom, <clears throat> there'll be a time that you operate under authority and there and and there uh, under a covering, and there will be another time in your life where you will provide the cov- the covering. When it was 2005, 2006, I operated under a covering in these uh, in these campus ministries. Now. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I don't think I'm uh, spilling any confidences with this, but uh, Mike was and several others, I think Josh, and I guess that's all that was here, right? The, they went on a, a, a missions trip to Serbia and uh, uh, had got a lot of resistance there. And up until one service, they, they had prayed very, very few people through. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm a uh, early riser. Uh, if I if I sleep past six o'clock, seven o'clock, I'm sick. Well, for whatever reason, and I don't know, I don't even know what the time difference was. Uh, whatever reason, the Lord woke me up at about three fifteen that morning, and I was in my office praying, and uh, I got a text from uh, Mike. Said, "Hey, can you take a call?" And uh, we went back and forth, and and basically, uh, the question was: was what what was my what is our help me Mike? What is our uh, uh, our 
our, our boundary of authority in this meeting, right? And so I began to talk to him and begin to explain to him what I, what I felt like that God had told me in this and what they were and what they were to do and what he was to proclaim and what God and what God was going to do uh, by that. I provided that I God used me to be able to provide that covering and I think it was that next service, right? Uh, that they had a breakthrough and however many people 10, ten people uh, got the Holy Ghost in a country to where that uh, basically very few people had gotten the Holy Ghost. And, and that, that is what a covering does. That is a sharing, a joining together to where that when you bump up against something <laughs> and it's like, whoa, what, what meaneth this? Is that you got the phone number. You, you know where to go to be able to say, hey, here's what's going on in my life. And that covering to be able to say, here's what the Lord, that covering actually, God already spoke, uh, speaking to that covering and say, here's what needs to be done. Boom, 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 boom. And here's what I'm going to do. Boom, 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 boom. That's the way that a covering works. That's the way that God manifests his authority. Praise God. When we use that authority, we use that authority, we build a covering. We establish a covering over us. We establish a covering beneath us. And here is, here is, the, here is great wisdom. Uh, the other part of this, Paul said that I, I, be, I build something and then he, if to edify, I use my authority to, to edify or to build, or I use that same authority for, for my own destruction. That's, that's, the rest of this, that's the rest of this scripture. So when I, start, when I start operating authority, I start trying to operate power <clears throat> with, no, with no covering, with no authority in my life, what I do is I set myself up to be an enemy with God. Because, because if God's not doing it, if you're opposing God, God's going to have to tear it down so that he can get the credit when it's built back up. So God's power and authority working through us establishes God's dominion. Uh, the kingdom is the king's dominion, and dominion establishes the boundaries in which the king's power and authority subjugate or overcome all that are within that. So what, I was, what God was able to do in this particular situation is to be able to say, Mike, here, here's the boundary of the authority. Here's where you need to operate while you're in that entire country. God has not given you, the, he's not given you authority to work in the entire country. He's given you this. And when he, began to, when he began to move in and begin to speak, that's when God gave that breakthrough. He gave the, God gave the dominion uh, in that particular instance. Thank God. Thank God. <clears throat> dominion is the force, strength, and might. And I'm skipping some good stuff here. Hmm. Let's click this very quickly. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 25. But Jesus called unto him and said, You know that the, pr <clears throat> that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for many. This, were, the, the, this is the uh, contrast of exercising dominion and exercising authority. You can go back and study this uh, with, the, with the notes. Uh, but, but effectively, here's the point, is that if you are exercising God's dominion and authority in your life, what you will do is you will, you will build those that you are serving that are under you through ministry and discipleship. That is, the, that is the true test of whether you are, are truly exercising authority uh, under a covering in your life. You will build those that are under you. You will edify them. You will create a covering for those that are under you. If you're exercising God's dominion and authority, so those under you serve you. 
you're going to do that to your own destruction. And that's what this scripture basically says is, is that if you do it to build, if you do it to build people, to build ministry, God's going to do it with you. If you do it to build your own kingdom, God's going to do it against you. You'll do it against God. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but God, the powers that be, of, uh, be ordained of God. God alone has all the power. He has all the authority. And whatever, whatever, whatever Lucifer does, he does because God gave him the authority. He's operating under the authority that, that God allowed him to have. Amen. All power and all authority comes from God. Praise God. And he always works from underneath a covering. He always manifests himself under a covering. So, the covering. We've, we've talked about the rule uh, and the role of a covering in that it is building. Now, I want to very quickly turn your attention to Psalm chapter 133. <clears throat> the scripture says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. And as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. I want to quickly talk to you about the law of flow. <clears throat> so we've talked about uh, power. We've talked about authority. We've talked about a covering. But there is a specific uh, uh, thing that happens in all, all of those underneath that covering and that, that is dictated by what I, what I have begun to refer to as the law of flow. Psalm 133, if, you, uh, any, if any of you guys own <clears throat> an actual paper Bible anymore. Anybody have one of those? Praise God, I see one. Hallelujah. If you look at that Bible, uh, and you've got Psalm 133 up, right? So right up under, underneath Psalm 133, what does it say? Say something like, a, a degrees of David. Song of degrees. Anybody know what that is? What's that? Praise God, not a mountain, but let's let's go. You 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 bumping up against it. Let's talk about it. So there's 15 of these. If you go back and you look, there's 15 of these psalms that are considered to be degrees, and the last one is Psalm 133. Most scholars, if you go to most commentaries, what it'll, what it'll tell you is, is that each one of these psalms were sung as they were ascending the 15 steps into the temple. So there were 15 steps that went into the presence of God. And God gave these, these degrees, these psalms of degrees. And the very last thing that he began to talk to them about before he got into their presence is unity. Now let's talk about the law, law of flow because the last thing that I want to happen here is, is that you figure out uh, how to operate power underneath authority, underneath a covering, and then you get yourself puffed up. Because there's a few things that you need to understand uh, in that. So the law of flow is simply this, is that everything flows down. In this particular psalm, uh, it, it begins talking about unity will. And then it goes through, and the very first example is, is, that, is that it is like the anointing. It's like the oil that flowed down on Aaron's beard, right? <clears throat> Aaron was the high priest. Everybody got that, right? And this oil was symbolic of anointing. It was symbolic of power in the Old Testament. So what, what, it, what they're talking about, Chester, is, is that, that the anointing would flow upon Aaron, but it would roll down off of his head, off of his covering, and it would roll onto his beard. Now, the significant thing about the beard is, is that in... in uh, biblical times, the longer your beard, the more wisdom that you had. So they would not, they, they generally would not 
cut their beard. So the longer that beard was, the, the, that, was a, that was a sign that you could look at that they had been through some stuff. And what God is talking about here is what he's trying to show us is, is that that oil rolled, rolled down. It came down, the law of flow, to the place where that he enacted or that he, uh, that he exercised power and authority. Because remember this, faith is always exercised by speaking. It's always exercised. You can't have faith if you don't speak. I believe, therefore I have spoken. Amen. So you can't, most of the time, uh, you can't speak uh, unless you've got anointing flowing in your life, unless you've got power flowing in your life, because that's where your faith is going to come from. And then he gives the example that it flowed down to, the rib, to, to his robe, even to the skirts. And this is, this is literally, if you go look this up, what you'll find is it's the place of reproduction that it's talking about, in that it went from one generation, the oil or the anointing, Went, was was anointed upon Aaron, and it went from one generation to the next generation. That power and authority rolled down; it flowed down from your covering. No, no one, no one gets authority and power by. I mean, you just you you don't get authority by yourself. You can get power by yourself, but you can't get the authority to exercise that power by yourself. It flows down. It flows off that beard. It flows off your elders. It flows off the ones that you've come alongside of that have provided you a covering that you've intertwined with them. <clears throat> Amen. Anointing, it flows down. When anointing starts flowing up, you got problems. And that's I said this earlier this week, at the, the, uh, or earlier uh, this morning, Apostolic authority, one of the characteristics is, the main characteristic is that those that are in authority speak and those that are under authority do. And when you start getting that flipped and those that are under authority begin to speak to try to cause those that are over authority to do, your puppy's going to have kittens pretty quick. Because what you've just done is you've just stepped outside of God's natural law of flow, that it's got to come down. So God, God lays this out, that there's anointing, that there's power, and it flows down. And then he comes uh, right behind this, and he says <clears throat> that uh, it, it is also like the dew on Hermon. Anybody know what, uh, what Hermon is? You were real close with the... With the <laughs> not yet, huh? I, I gave you a picture uh, in the notes. Mount Hermon is the northernmost part of Israel, and it's also the highest part of Israel. Mount Hermon is uh, on the border. It's, it's right, uh, right near Damascus, I think. And uh, Mount Hermon is very unique in that there are four sources to the Jordan River. So the Jordan River basically runs from the northernmost part of Israel to the southernmost part of Israel. And there are four sources to the Jordan River. One of those sources will is the dew that comes off of Mount Hermon. There is so much dew that flows off of that mountain that it forms one of the headwaters of the Jordan River. And I sent you a picture of the actual rapids. There's a picture in those notes that shows you how much dew falls or, or flows off of that mountain. Dew can also be considered to be night rain. And uh, dew actually, that won't go into it. I don't have time uh, to go into it. But let me just proclaim to you that what this is talking about uh, is that uh, oil is symbolic of anointing. But water is symbolic of forgiveness. And Mount Hermon literally means, it, it is the, the name of it is the Mountain of Elders. And that dew flows off, forms the Jordan River, and goes into the Sea of Galilee. And there's always got to be a flow. 
coming into you and out of you. That, that flow, that Jordan River comes out of the Galilee, uh, Sea of Galilee, and it eventually ends up in the Dead Sea. And the reason that the Dead Sea is, is dead is because it has no outflow. It's 1,274 feet below sea level, and it has nowhere to go. It has nowhere to build another covering. It has another, no, no other source for it to go in. <clears throat> and so it just stops. And when it stops, when flow stops, everything dies. Because all of the impurities that are in you, when you stop letting God flow through you, all the impurities that are in you will begin to build up because it is God's flow that purifies you. So here you have this contrast of, of oil and water. And oil being the power, water being the forgiveness. And here's what I've, here's what I've come to end this session on, is that here the, the main question that you, most of you starting out, you look very, you, most of you are very young, right? As you grow older, let me, let me tell you the trap that I got into. The trap that I got into when, when, I, was, when I was your age is I, want, I, I ask everybody I could, man, how do I get power? How do, I, how do I get anointing? How do I get authority? Anybody else want to be honest and say that's what you do? Yeah. After 26 years in ministry, Will, you know what the very first question that I ask folks now? that come alongside of me and try to intertwine, the very first thing I ask them is not how much anointing and how much power they got flowing in them. I ask them how much forgiveness they've got flowing in them. And the reason is, is because that's where unity, that's how unity exists to be able to have power and anointing. You've got to have as much uh, forgiveness flowing in your life to be able to balance anointing. That's why the scripture says that offenses must come. They must come because you don't know what's in your own heart. But when an offense boils up, you get involved in ministry. If you've been involved in ministry more than about 32 seconds, you'll get offended. And the reason is, the reason is, is because no man knows his own heart. And God's got to have that offense to bubble up all of the dross that's in you so that he, you can decide whether you're going to forgive or whether you're going to try to take revenge. And here is, the, here is the secret. Here is the thing that you need to understand. For many years I've asked this question. How is it that someone that was used so powerfully, so powerfully uh, in, in, in preaching in the Word of God, how is it that they could walk away from God? Anybody ever had that question before? Yeah. Let me tell you the, let me tell you the answer that God gave me. They had all of this going, right? The Bible says, I just read you the scripture in Ezekiel chapter 28. It says that Lucifer is the anointed cherub that covereth. And I believe what happened was, was that they stopped letting forgiveness flow in their life. And Lucifer, who is the great imitator, came right in and provided a covering of anointing. He knows what anointing smells like, what it feels like. He knows what power looks like. He knows what it feels like. And he, and he came in and covered them. And strong deception, strong delusion got on them because forgiveness stopped flowing in their life. And all of a sudden they swapped what authority and what covering they were operating under. And they didn't even know. And the reason is, is because they stopped letting forgiveness flow in their life. There is one thing that Lucifer cannot do. You want to know what that is? He cannot forgive. And when you stop forgiving in your life, in your life, and you start depending upon oil and power and anointing, but you won't let forgiveness flow in your life, you are setting yourself up to where that you will change coverings and not even know that you've changed coverings. <clears throat> because the law of flow happens whether it's in the kingdom of God or in Lucifer's kingdom. It's all the same. He's got the same covering. He's got the same, same structure, same whatever. But because we're human, because we think that we can do it, we're, we're, 
idolatry, uh, idolaters in nature. Amen. That's what we are. We can do it. We can do it ourselves. We don't need God, and it's so quick to, to change over uh, from from depending upon God to depending upon ourselves, and then it is just one small little inkling to stop depending upon ourselves and depending upon a covering that is that is in darkness and not in light. Let's pray for just a moment. In Jesus' name, there is power. <clears throat> there is authority. All of that has to be operated under a covering. Praise God. In the name of Jesus. Father, give us wisdom. Give us direction, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray that the spirit of revelation would fall in this place, God. Lead us, guide us, God. Give us the direction of the steps that you want us to take. Give us the pace of those steps, God. Give us the length of our stride. God, give us wisdom to be able to operate the power that you've bestowed upon us with the Holy Ghost. To be able to operate that in apostolic authority under a covering, God. In the name of Jesus, 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 God, by your grace, let us do those things. Let us accomplish your will. Let's continue to take a few additional moments. You need to make up in your mind to forgive. As you begin to step into this apostolic ministry, you will be challenged to forgive your peers to forgive leaders, to forgive those that will work alongside you. You will be challenged to forgive. You must have the love of God working in you to be able to forgive. Let the washing of the word wash over your soul right now so that you can forgive. Let the washing of the word come over your spirit and wash over your soul so that you can forgive. Praise God. Praise God. What you heard 
will make or break how effective you are on your campus. And what I'm ta talking about specifically is the ability and the proficiency of forgiveness. It will make or break the effectiveness of not only campus ministry, but anything you do in the kingdom of God. Because how tragic would it be that people would come into the kingdom through your life, but because of your inability to forgive, you end up being lost. How tragic would it be that people would find the message and the greatness of salvation through your testimony and through your ministry, but your soul ends up being lost in the mix. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, through Brother Mott, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I believe Brother Mike will let us know that we can break for a few moments before our next session. And uh, Brother Mike, if you want to give any additional announcements with that. I just want to tag on to what was said. It's no wonder that the spirit of this age is so strong in rebellion and telling you you don't need an authority in your life. You wonder why? Parents are bad. Cops are bad. Everybody who's in authority is bad. That's the spirit of this age that doesn't want you to believe in authority. In fact, if you look at the book of Jude, it tells you about three of the main end time spirits. The spirit of Cain, convenience. Spirit of Balaam, operating in a gifting without a covering and doing it for profit. And the spirit of Korah. The spirit of Korah was the man who said, Moses, who do you think you are? Who do, you, who do you think you are telling me what to do? And guess what? Moses didn't strike him and kill him. God opened up the earth, and him and his followers went straight to hell. Because that's how serious God is about authority. But we have been wounded. We have been hurt by people in authority. Because man is the one that operates in authority, but man can pervert. And man can take advantage of you. That's where forgiveness flows. That's why forgiveness is so important. David had the king of Israel, his father-in-law, and basically you could say sort of his pastor, throwing spears at his head. But he never picked it up and threw it back. And it wasn't until God brought a Samuel where another man in authority covered and protected him and helped him through the wound. If you will be patient and you'll stay submitted, if you're dealing with a leader that's throwing spears, God will bring you a Samuel. The problem is, though, we pick up an Absalom spirit. We don't pick up a David spirit. And we start to hate and resent authority and rebel and build our own kingdom. And that's why you see people hanging from trees by their own strength. That's what happened to Absalom. He got caught in the trees. He got caught in the woods by his own hair. It was his own destruction because he rebelled against authority. We will destroy ourselves and become Absaloms if we don't submit and take the wound sometimes and take the spears and be like David and keep forgiving. Be like David. No matter how bad somebody's hurt you, no matter how uh, hard that wound, hurt. no matter how bad it is, how much that wound hurts, you will be hurt by leaders. You will be hurt by people. You'll be hurt by saints. You're going to be hurt by people that are actually true men of God because they're human. But if you learn to stay submitted, you learn how to keep this principle of apostolic authority operating in your life, God will honor you, God will bless you, and one day God will elevate you for being submitted and bringing yourself low. The Bible says he that abases himself, God will exalt. But he who exalts himself, God will abase. The principles of God cannot be changed. The principles of God must work. So no matter how 
nasty somebody is, no matter how uh, full of their flesh somebody is, saint, leader, you name it, if you obey God's principles, they are never changing. Heaven and earth will pass away before God's word will never pass away. His word is free, forever eternal, forever established, meaning by you submitting to the principle, no matter what happens in the, in the natural world around you, God must honor you. God must bless you because you submitted to the eternal, never-ending, end, changing principles of God. But the spirit of this age wants you to make you think you can do it yourself. You don't need an authority. You don't need to submit to anybody. You're your own man. You're your own woman. That's the voice of Satan himself. I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. I don't need God in my life. You can try to spiritualize that because of your hurt. But still, like Brother Mott said, you try to spiritualize that even as a good person, great person, you can still change coverings. And we don't want to do that. The spirits of this age, of the end times, the book of Jude tells us, spirit of Cain, convenience, that's that whole charismatic movement. The spirit of Balaam, operating in a gift that you can benefit from. And the spirit of Korah, rebelling against God's authority. The three end time main spirits that we will experience and we are already experiencing. Stay submitted. Stay under your covering. No matter what spears get thrown, no matter what manipulation, no matter who hurts you, God will honor your obedience to his principles and his word. And God will bring you a Samuel if he has to. Amen. Can we just one more time lift our hands and thank God for the, rev the spirit of revelation that was in this place. Thank God for the spirit of revelation that was in this place. God, I thank you for revelation. I thank you for your power. I thank you for your understanding that you're releasing upon us of apostolic authority. God, I give you glory and I give you praise for what you've done. Seal it with thankfulness. Seal the revelation with thankfulness. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. God, I honor you for protecting me and saving my soul with this word. Because some of your souls are going to be saved because you're going to endure more hardships even in the next few months, few years. But because of the revelation of apostolic authority, God will protect your spirit and God's going to keep you right in his will. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the vessel that just spoke this morning. Hallelujah. I give you glory. And I give you praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Clap your hands and thank the Lord for what he's already done. Amen.